Welcome back to Having Coffee with Frank Collada. Let's talk about real life. If it was a robbery, a murder, whatever we had to do. Did we wear certain clothes for it? Yeah, of course. I wouldn't go with a suit and die on unless it required it. I wouldn't wear a policeman's uniform unless it required it. I mean, I've done all that stuff with all different kinds of outfits. Uh, if I didn't wear gloves, I'd make sure I wiped up after I walked out of there. Sometimes you can't go and do something with a set of gloves on. You'll scare somebody out of the door. That they'll know you're there. You got bad intentions. So, of course, I would wipe that down. But nine times out of the ten, you always had gloves on when you were doing something. They were either work gloves or plastic clear gloves. Mask, hoods, none at all. That's, but depending on the robbery, you know, the location, the timing, uh, guns, let's go to guns. Of course you don't want, you got a gun that wouldn't have a serial number on it. Because what gun you got, you don't know where it came from. Usually when you wind up with a gun, it's because somebody's trying to get rid of it and was using a bad, bad deal. So you want to get a gun with no serial numbers or you'd have them removed. And we slowly but surely learned that they could draw them numbers up with this asset. So that wasn't much good. So you always wanted to make sure, hopefully, that the gun that you were using and whatever you were doing it with wasn't used in a murder because you could get charged for a murder you didn't do. So we always tried to clear that clear that up. Uh, sometimes we throw cotton in our mouth to change our voice, our speech. It all depended on the different type of robbery or score you were going to do. Uh, everything, every robberies is a different thing. Everyone. There's no two things the same when you're doing cor corrupt things. No two things. And that was part of that life, doing that. Many, and certain instances where you use the gun and you had to dispose of it, you, dismant you dismantle it. There's only three, four parts on a gun you could dismantle if there even was that many. And you wouldn't catch them all in the same spot. You'd spread it around. So you'd get rid of it, especially if you shot somebody on the robbery. If you didn't shoot nobody on the robbery, you'd, you'd keep the gun. The one thing like guys like us always like to hang on to, because we grew fond of it, was our work cars. These are cars that you would use in the emission of a robbery, burglary, murder, whatever. And you put a lot of money in these cars, and you knew the car. It was like... So you have relatives, you got familiar with it. You almost, be, you know, I had an obsession trying to keep this car. At first I used to say, I get rid of what's on your car. But then he slowly grow into it because your vehicle is what gets you away from the robbery. And if it's not performing right, you're going to get caught. So it's a big part of any criminal's life is the vehicle. And were they legit? Nine times out of ten, they were under fictitious names. They weren't stolen cars. In some, in some cases, they were. <clears throat> and it wasn't hard to uh, fictitiously register a car. We used to do them through, they were called currency exchanges back in the day. And we probably know the guy that owned the currency exchange and he would do the paperwork for us and bring the license plates back. And you give him an extra $100. So that's how we used to do it with cars. Big part of our lives. Make sure they were fast, strong, and appealing, and they fitted into the location or wherever you were going to do it. But if you went into a, a rich, rich neighborhood where well, you're not going to bring a Ford in there and drive it around the neighborhood, case and all places, you're going to have another car, maybe a big Lincoln and maybe a Cadillac. It, it looked like it belonged there. And that's what you would drive into these certain areas. Uh, if it was like a stick up, a real fast stick up, or a jewelry store heist, you use this uh, Ford with a big engine, you know, Chevy. So I'm giving these guys a lesson on how to steal. You can't do that no more. Too many cameras. You can't do that shit. 
It was a lot easier. And then back in my day, it was hard too. You people are going to think I'm crazy. But cars are a lot like a woman. You treat them good, they'll treat you good. And we always made sure we treated our cars good, just like we treated our woman. They would treat us good. They would take us to safety, take us in and out of bad situations, get us out of there. You depended on a lot on the car. Let's just do your wife. You know, a different way, you know what I'm saying. Like, come on, don't be stupid. You understand what I'm saying. Anyway, cars, to me, and I think the most criminals at the time, they felt the same way I felt. I hope you understand this little bit of a segment I'm telling you. I've been a car lover all my life. And they used to write about me. Nobody knew what they were writing about in the newspapers. But they say, a car buff, they call me a car buff. They say, I smoked back then. They say, this guy would buy a car when the ashtrays were full. Well, I never let my ashtrays get full because they stink up the car. Uh, I love cars. I used to, maybe three, four new cars a year. Easily. You never knew what I was driving. I get tired, I go to another one. I was stealing that money. That's another thing. If I belonged to the outfit back then, I was connected to them. I'd have to drive what they drive. What am I robbing for? I'm robbing to enjoy myself, to have nice cars, to go have nice meals, to tip, to wear nice clothes. Get the clothes. Let's go to clothes. All of us guys. We didn't buy them off the hangar in the store. We had tailor shops. We knew guys that were tailors. Grease balls from the old country. We'd go over there and we'd, get, we'd steal the, the looms of cl the cloth, the clothing, the cloth. We'd wrap it from some shop. We'd bring it to the tailor and he'd cut out a, and he'd make a suit for us or pants. Even shirts. We'd start making shirts. Car coats. We call them car coats. I think. I think Joey DeFranzo was the first one, Johnny DeFranzo's brother, was the first one that came out with a, a coat and he called it a car coat. It was pretty nice. So then all of us guys used to get the car coats made. Let me explain to you a car coat. Think of an overcoat or a top coat. Cut it down. Cut the bottom off of it. You still got your two pockets. And it hangs a little below your hips. A little below your hips. That's the way I would call it a car coat. It opens down the front, just like a suit jacket would. You can make them a double breasted or single breasted. I prefer the single breasted. You know, two buttons, I should say. Most guys did. And uh, you, you can't buy one nowadays for less than $500. And we used to get them tailor made. So you know, don't forget, we had all the material, it was free. That's the big cost. And the tailor. We used to hang in the tailor shops. If you ever want to see a wise guy, go in the tailor shop. He's in the back room getting fitted out for some clothes. All the time. They made money in them grease balls. We used to use all the time in tailors. They were good. Now that you guys know all about the guns, the clothes, the cars, the ladies, have a great day. I'll see you later. Enjoy coffee with Frank Collada. I'm going to tell you again, don't forget to hit the prescribe button. That's the way I say it, prescribe button. Talk to you soon. God bless. Hit that button, prescribe.